The McCormick Energy Solution Conference with guest speaker Dr. Stephen Coonan is made possible by The Ohio State University. You know, I, I became a close student of energy about uh, five years ago, a bit more, and um, I think very rapidly learned a couple things. First of all, that providing secure and sustainable clean energy to the country and to the world presents a set of great challenges. The second thing is that energy is a pretty bewildering subject at first. It is a mix of science, technology, economics, politics, and people who have not been exposed to it much are generally bewildered by it. And finally, the third thing I learned is that it is possible to understand the facts about energy deeply enough so that you can pretty cleanly separate what we could do from what we should do and try to help inform what we will do. And that deep understanding, I think, is extraordinarily important for the public and for policymakers as we try to navigate our way through these, some of these energy issues. And so what I thought I would do for roughly the next 40 minutes or so is take you through some of that factual basis, help you understand how it underpins some of the things that we in the government are doing or trying to do in order to address those challenges. So I'm going to, to really talk about the factual energy landscape are pretty much from an American perspective. Very briefly at the end, we'll, we'll try to go global. And uh, if we can, let's see, go through the first chart. The first challenge, you can really think about the problem in terms of two pretty separate challenges. The first of them has got to do with energy security. This is about ensuring a reliable and economic supply of liquid hydrocarbons because our transportation system is powered, for reasons I'll discuss in a moment, almost exclusively by gasoline and diesel derived from crude oil. The administration has announced a goal in promoting both energy security and to some extent greenhouse gas reduction of reducing the country's use by about three and a half million barrels a day of crude oil. We use on average about 20 million barrels a day. This corresponds to the amount of oil that we import from the Middle East in Venezuela every day. And it corresponds to about 25% of the oil that we use every day in transportation. Right? First goal, first problem. We go uh, to the next chart. I guess uh, I'm going to have to rely on you to help advance the uh, chart. That's fine. The second uh, challenge is associated with greenhouse gas emissions. This is mostly, as I'll show you, about carbon dioxide from stationary sources, heat and power. The uh, goal in the government is roughly a 20% reduction by 2020 in U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, and by the middle of the century, an 80% reduction by 2050, and I'll discuss some of the science that lies behind those goals. We go to the next chart. These goals, when taken together, imply significant changes in the kinds of energy we use and how we use that energy. Because those changes are significant, uh, if we could have the next uh, click, we need to identify, develop, demonstrate, and deploy solutions that are cost effective, that are material, namely that can have a significant impact, and that are timely, namely that can have an impact within several decades or so. And at the same time, we have to be able to do this while creating jobs in the process. These are, this is not an impossible goal at all. On the other hand, you have to be thinking clearly, and you have to understand the potential of various technologies and the economics associated with them, and I'll take you through some of that as well. We go to the next uh, clip. Those of us who aspire to transform the energy system really have to pay attention to this chart. This is historical data, and it shows over the last 150 years, from 1850 before the Civil War up to pretty much the present, how the U.S. gets its energy. And you can see a succession of sources starting with wood at the time of the Civil War, and then 
uh, a wedge of coal as the Industrial Revolution takes over, and then oil as the Transportation Revolution hits in the uh, early to middle 20th century, a wedge of gas coming in in the late 20th century, just a little bit of nuclear, and then just an even smaller bit of renewables in the upper right of that chart. When you look at this chart, two things jump out at you. First is that energy technologies do change. They change in response to development of technology itself, in response to economics, and in response to regulation. However, they change slowly. It takes many decades to affect a significant change in energy sources. They change slowly, first of all, because of scale. Energy involves big things, often that last a long time. A refinery can last for 50 or 60 years. A power plant lasts 40 years. Houses, where uh, we use a significant fraction of our energy, last for a century or more. And so this issue of scale is one uh, that slows down the pace of energy change. Another is the issue of ubiquity. Energy is everywhere for heat, light, mobility, so much so that we hardly think about it. But because it's here, everywhere, touching our lives, many people are interested in it. The consumers, producers, governments, NGOs. They all have something to say, and their interests often don't align. And so things move slowly for that reason. A third reason is interoperability. The energy system is interconnected together. And so, for example, an oil company, like my former employer, BP, cannot unilaterally change the kind of fuel that it produces because it's got to work in all the cars that are out there. And that slows down change. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, there's the issue of incumbency. We've already got pretty good ways of providing heat, light, and mobility. And any new technology that comes in has got to compete at cost and at scale if it's going to have a significant impact. It's not like, for example, cell phones. When cell phones were introduced in the 1990s or so, they provided an entirely new service. You could talk on the run. People were willing to pay quite a bit for that. We now have many competing ways of communicating, and so consequently cost becomes an issue. Same is true of energy. We go to the next chart. All right, so let me now focus in a bit on the energy security problem, the first one. Transportation is powered almost exclusively by liquid hydrocarbons, and uh, those are derived currently from crude oil. Why is that? Why are we using so much oil for transportation? The answer is that liquid hydrocarbons are pretty darn good as a transportation fuel. They have a very high energy density, namely how much energy can you carry around in a small space or mass, 50 times better than the best battery we can produce. They're also pretty easy to use. They are reasonably economic, barring some price spikes that we have seen in the last year or two. The infrastructure exists already, and they are available. Given the turnover rate in the um, uh, vehicle fleet, which I'll discuss in a moment, um, it's unlikely that liquid hydrocarbons are going to disappear from transportation anytime soon. We go to the next chart. <coughs> this is the U.S. use of liquid fuels. Millions of barrels per day on the left. And you can see our use has been growing since 1970. It went down quite a bit during the first uh, oil embargo in the late 70s. It's been climbing back up. And it's roughly at a peak right now of about 20 million barrels a day. As we go forward, you can see that most of the uh, oil is used for transportation, but we are projecting a wedge of biofuels growing uh, through 2030, as shown there. Remember, again, the administration goal is to reduce uh, that amount by about 3.5 million barrels a day. Interestingly, we use a decreasing amount of oil for electrical power. That got squeezed out in the uh, 70s, and a more or less constant amount of oil for heating uh, largely in the Northeast, where buildings are heated by fuel oil. Uh, if we go to the next chart, the second statement about the energy security problem is that the U.S. imports about 60% of the oil that it uses uh, every day. And we can uh, look at that graph for the next one. 
Uh, the oil imports have grown steadily from 1990 to just about now. We're seeing a slight fall off in the last year or so, in part due to improved fuel efficiency, and in part, of course, due to price as well. You can see these projections going out to 2030 are highly price sensitive. If the price is low, then we'll import more, and if the price is high, we will import less because we will use less. Pretty simple economics. Associated with the import is uh, what's shown on the next chart. Uh, two things. One is that crude oil is largely a global commodity, and as the rest of the world develops, one of the first things that developing countries like to purchase is mobility. After that, electricity. And so as China, India, a number of other countries become more economically well off, we're going to see a rise in crude demand under business as usual. The world will need more crude oil. And the crude resources, the easy crude, the crude that is relatively straightforward to get out of the ground, that flows simply, is increasingly concentrated geographically and politically in the hands of countries that are far away, uh, governments whose actions may not be as transparent as we would like, the production is not as transparent as we would like, and perhaps have uncertain futures. You can see that in the next chart, <coughs> which shows the percent of conventional oil reserves in the hands of the national oil companies, the NOx, as opposed to the international oil companies, the IOCs. So the NOx are companies like Saudi Aramco, PDVSA, Petrobras, and so on. And you can see that those countries in the big 11 countries of OPEC hold about 65% of the known conventional reserves, but are only producing about 40% of the oil every day. The balance of the oil is produced by the international oil companies, the IOCs, Exxon, Chevron, Total, BP, and so on. Those folks have access to less than about 10% of the reserves. So you can see that this is perhaps not the best situation to be in. If you take our imports of 12 million barrels a day and multiply by $70 a barrel, you get something like $250 per year that the U.S. is sending abroad because of oil consumption. Right? You can calibrate $250 billion on your own in terms of what it means in the national economy. We go to the next chart. So what can we do? The first thing, as in all energy matters, is to encourage efficiency and the conservation that it almost always leads to. CAFE standards have been enacted by the government recently to take the current uh, vehicle uh, mileage of new cars sold from about 27 miles per gallon up to about 35 miles per gallon over the next 10 years. I should remark that the world's best practice is about 42 miles per gallon right now. If we look at the next chart, you can see that. This shows uh, the average fuel economy of new light-duty vehicles, that's cars and light trucks, sold in the U.S. both historically and projected out. And you can see that both technology and price make a difference as we go forward. As I said, we're at about 27 right now, and we're projected to rise significantly over the next 20 years. Um, notice that this chart is for new light-duty vehicles. Those are the ones that are sold every year. Because a vehicle lasts about 15 years in the car fleet, it will take 15 or 20 years for these standards to gradually percolate through the whole car park, as we call it in the UK. Right? So it's another reason that things take time uh, to change in energy. Uh, if we go, uh, let's go back, if we could, just let me go through those other bullets. Uh, back one more, if we could. Okay, uh, other things that are eminently sensible to do, we can downsize vehicles, we can lightweight them, new materials, composites, for example, behavior, Another thing we can do is make the cost of driving evident. The use of gasoline is very sensitive to price. Last summer, summer, and a, uh, summer a year ago, when the price was so high, four and a half dollars or more a gallon in California, gasoline use dropped by 8% pretty much in a month. It's clear that things are price sensitive, right? and it's clear that we can conserve on a pretty short time scale 
at least at the 5 to 8% level. So one of the things we might imagine doing is not necessarily raising the price, but simply making the cost of driving evident to the consumer. Imagine, for example, that when you filled up at the pump, you paid not only for the cost of the fuel, but you paid your road tax, you paid your insurance by the mile, you paid the price of your vehicle by the mile, people would realize what the full cost of transportation is and perhaps be a little bit more sensitive to how much they're using. No increase in price, just making the real price evident. Behavior, as in most things associated with energy, there's a heavy social science component. Behavior, psychology, is a pretty important part of the picture. All right, let's go forward a couple more charts. All right, so an another thing we can do is to encourage novel and alternative vehicle technologies at cost. Right? There are technical things we can do to the vehicles. Uh, the internal combustion engine, as uh, old as it is, has a great deal of technical headroom. Homogeneous charge compression ignition, exhaust gas recycling, variable valve timing, selective cylinder deactivation. These are all technologies that are existing now and are about to be deployed in vehicles that can significantly improve engine efficiency uh, at modest cost, say another $1,000 per vehicle for something like 20% improvement in energy efficiency. Of course, the consumer makes it back in fuel savings uh, if the vehicle costs a bit more. Um, of course, the, you know, the engine efficiency can be misused. I didn't show you, but if you look in the decade of the 1990s, the engines in new cars improved in efficiency by 23%. Uh, that was sold in the U.S. That's a remarkable gain in improvement. But that got eaten up by almost completely by increases in vehicle weight and performance. And so we, we need to be careful about how we use increased efficiency, uh, although it certainly is there. Beyond improving the internal combustion engine, we can go to the next uh, bullet, we're going to see a gradual electrification of the vehicle uh, fleet, passenger cars, and that is largely paced by battery costs. We can go from hybrids, which are available now and just about economic. We can go to plug-in hybrids, where you can drive for a significant number of miles with just electricity from the grid, and maybe eventually to battery uh, vehicles. Again, all of this is determined by the rate at which we can improve battery technology and bring down battery costs. And there are vigorous DOE programs underway to try to make that happen. We go to the next bullet. I, I should remark that uh, there is a, a loan guarantee program, grant program, the advanced vehicle technology and battery technology program uh, that uh, disperses money to companies in order to try to accelerate this progression. Uh, I would just note that uh, 34 million of it so far has gone to Ohio in, in stimulus money to try to get these things uh, underway, battery manufacturing. We go to the next chart. Then we, beyond the vehicles, we work on the fuel side, and we can encourage with consistency. Again, consistency is really important given the long time scales. Uh, a set of unconventional fuels. If we uh, click next, um, biofuels are most obvious. Uh, when you look at where you're going to get your carbon from, beyond fossil fuels, biofuels, biomass is the most obvious uh, uh, source to go to. Uh, we need to learn how to convert the structural material of plants, the lignocellulose, into fuels. Right now, most of the biofuels come from sugars and starches, which are foods, and hence not a particularly good idea. Uh, we need to work on better feedstocks, learning how to grow more biomass in a sustainable manner, not use food. Uh, we need to work on better fuel molecules. Right now, the largest biofuel in the U.S. is ethanol, Ethanol is uh, not an optimal fuel molecule. It has only 70% the energy density of gasoline. It's corrosive. It picks up water and so rust containers. We can do much better. You know, gasoline um, has on average eight carbon molecules. That's why we talk about octane. Ethanol has only two carbon molecules. And so you might think that somewhere between the two and the eight, there's room to make biofuels that are better butanol, uh, other sorts of uh, hydrocarbons uh, are things that people are working on right now to try to do that. Algae uh, is a, a dream. Some people think that they have a way to, to, to turn large-scale algae farming into um, fuels. Uh, we shall see. As in many things in energy, it's a question of technology 
and economics. Um, what is the government doing? Renewable fuel standards. So there are standards that mandate how much biofuels need to be in the uh, uh, fuel that you buy at the pump. And the DOE has started a set of bioenergy research centers and integrated biorefinery demonstrations to try to accelerate this progression away from the fossil carbon to the uh, renewable carbon. We go to the next chart. Okay, I now want to move away from the energy security problem and talk a little bit about stabilizing carbon dioxide, which in some ways is a much more problematic situation. And so I'll spend a little bit of time on the background because it's important to understand this. Lots of misconceptions here. If we go, uh, the, f the first statement is that the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere is rising at an accelerating rate. So not only is it going up, but it's going up faster and faster. At 550 parts per million, and we'll, we'll talk about what that means in a moment, uh, is a threshold beyond which many people believe that unpleasant, if not catastrophic, climate changes will ensue should we cross that, that line. You might say 2050 is far away, it's 40 years from now, why should we worry so much? The answer is that the energy infrastructure that we're building lasts a long time. If we build energy infrastructure that is emitting carbon dioxide, now it will still be emitting by 2050 and continue to contribute to the problem. So there's a timeliness and an urgency here that we need to address. We go to the next chart. This shows the data. Um, I'm a scientist, and so I, you know, I really don't believe things until I actually see the data. Uh, this shows atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration when it was first measured in 1958 up until 2004. It started out um, in these measurements at 315 parts per million. Be in the, before the Industrial Revolution, it was about 280 parts per million. And this curve uh, continues to go up. It's now at about 386 or 387 parts per million. And it's going up at about 2 ppm per year. So as I said, we'll hit 550 at just about uh, the middle of this century. This, uh, for many reasons, some nuances in these data, we know that this is human caused. Right? It is caused by fossil fuels and other human activities. We go to the next chart. It's a little bit complicated chart associated with the carbon cycle, and I realize that from that distance you probably can't see it, but let me just point out the important, the point I want to make. If you look at the amount of carbon that flows up and back from the land surface to the atmosphere every year, it's just about the same going up as coming down. If you can read it, it's 119 goes up and 120 goes down. These are billion tons of carbon per year. The ocean's pretty much similarly about 70 or 80 up and back every year. But what's important, if you click on the next one, is the, no, go back one, is the fossil fuels that are 6.4 in this chart, billion tons of carbon a year, and the land use changes another one point something per year. These are constant. They don't change with the seasons up and back. We are adding carbon dioxide continually to the atmosphere by the fossil fuels that we're burning and by the forests that we're cutting down. Okay. And if we go to the next chart, the emissions, how much we're putting up into the atmosphere every year, are growing at something like 2 to 3% a year, largely due to the increased use of coal and oil. We go to the next chart. That's the actual data. Again, millions of tons of carbon dioxide over the last 150 years or so. And like all curves in energy, it goes up and to the right. And you can see perhaps going up at an alarming rate. So this is how much actually goes into the atmosphere every year. We go to the next chart. The most difficult execrable fact about CO2 in the atmosphere is that it lives for a very long time. Now, whether it's 400 years or 1,000 years, there are several different timescales involved, it hardly matters. It's a long time compared to human experience. It's a long time compared to the rate at which we can change things in society. And this long lifetime means that the carbon dioxide is effectively accumulating in the atmosphere. It's not like local pollution, where if you turn off the smokestack, the air gets clear in a couple days. 
Once we put the carbon dioxide up, it's effectively up there forever. If we go to the next chart, that means that we need to make drastic reductions in emissions, and that means very large changes in how we produce and use energy. We'll go to the next chart. We can see that. You can hit the button again. Here's a little cartoon that I uh, stole from one of my friends, Rob Sacco at Princeton, that illustrates what's more what's going on. We can think about the atmosphere like a bathtub and the amount that we're adding into the bathtub through the tap is about 30 billion tons a year of carbon dioxide from fossil fuel burning and land use. Of the 30 billion that we add in, the oceans absorb about eight. The land gets fertilized a bit, uh, absorbs another seven, and so 15 billion go out of the atmosphere, but 15 billion remain in the atmosphere. And so this tub keeps filling up as uh, we keep adding the fossil fuels. Even if we turn down the tap some, it's still going to fill up because the drains can only operate at a certain rate. Right? If we go to the next chart, we'll see what the implications of that are for our attempts to rein in uh, carbon dioxide concentration. Let's go to the next one. Oh, let's skip this. This is not relevant right now. So if you click once, we'll click through these. The chart on the left shows emissions, all right? And the historical data at a projection at about 1.5% growth rate. Those emissions, as I mentioned, are accumulating in the atmosphere. We click the next one, and that drives the concentration, which is what's important for the climate, up at roughly the same rate. If we manage, as you'll see by clicking next, to make a modest reduction in our emissions, such as shown by that green line. The concentration, we we'll click again, uh, will drop similarly as shown by that curve. And that means, if you click now, that if we believe, for example, that 600, as shown here, is the threshold above which we should not go, what we have done by those modest reductions is simply delayed, if you click once more, the time at which we cross the threshold, but have not prevented it. And that means we need to make really major reductions in emissions if we're going to solve this CO2 problem. Uh, if you click the, the next one, uh, this shows what's needed to be done. If you look on the left, there are a set of colored emissions trajectories, say the green ones, which would lead on the right to stabilization in the concentration at the green level or at the blue level or at the red level, as shown. And you see that what we need to do is to essentially stop the rise in emissions now and then have it fall off or let it rise a bit and then cut back even more drastically. You can see that by the end of this century, we need to have reduced emissions by about a factor of two or so or perhaps even more uh, if we have any hope of stabilizing. Um, I, you know, I was a professor for 30 years. And uh, I used to look at something like this and say, we got a big problem. Uh, when I was in business, I learned you're not allowed to say that. All you could say is, we got a challenge. Right? <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out what the right thing is to say now that I'm in government. All right? <laughs> An opportunity, right. Jeff's got it. That's good. Yeah, good. Anyway, look, this is just the facts, all right? This is the science. I think it's not so widely appreciated uh, what the magnitude of this problem is. We go to the next chart. Beyond these science problems, there are social challenges in stabilizing CO2. If we click the next one, emissions have historically increased with economic activity, especially during development. Let's go to the next chart. Uh, also, em emissions are heterogeneous around the globe. Different countries are emitting at different rates. The developed world has high emissions per capita, but growing very slowly. The developing world has very low emissions per capita, but growing rapidly. And this graph over there, uh, the map of the world, shows essentially where the developed countries are versus the developing countries, GDP map. If we then look at the next chart, uh, this chart says a lot. It shows how much each person is responsible for emitting as a function of the GDP per person in constant dollars, and trajectories for different countries from 1980 to 2005, so roughly 25 years. 
The US per capita, which is up in the upper right, is high, but not growing at all, essentially, uh, over the last 25 years. Where there are other developed countries, Ireland, Norway, France, and so on, which show that it is possible to have a developed economy with a lower emissions rate. And then there's a broad swath of countries here in the developing world, China, India, that more or less march up universally and constantly as their economy increases, their emissions go up. What's interesting or sobering is if you, you do the next click, the current global average today is about four tons of CO2 per capita, the height of that red line. If we hope to stabilize emissions, if you click the next one, by 2050, need to go down to that green bar per capita. Notice that that is less than uh, is emitted currently by India, uh, certainly China as well. So we need to roughly quarter per capita emissions uh, over the next 40 years if we're going to stabilize CO2. There are some interesting anomalies on this chart. France, you see that green hook over here? This is France. France is low compared to everybody else in that economic range because France gets 80% of its electricity from nuclear power. Similarly, Brazil is low over here. Brazil is low because it has a lot of hydropower and it runs a good fraction of its transport on emissions neutral bioethanol from sugarcane, all right? So that's some hint as to kind of things we need to be doing if we're gonna address this problem. Go to the next chart. Uh, this shows something about the heterogeneity of emissions around the globe. This is CO2 emissions since 1850, basically. The OECD countries, the developed world, going up like so. The non-OECD countries, showing the uh, lavender line. Uh, they crossed over uh, a few years ago, and you can see that the lavender line is going up sharply. Uh, and uh, let's see if we click the next one. Most of this century's emissions will come from the developing world. Okay? That is not a statement of blame or anything like that. It's just a statement about the numbers. Okay? You can get into interesting discussions about whose carbon is it when the US or when Europe purchases manufacturing goods, manufactured goods from China, let's say, and China emits because it uses coal in the course of that manufacturing, who is responsible for that? Um, I don't know, I think that's above my pay grade, but anyway, it's something to think about. Uh, let's go on. This chart, a reminder that greenhouse gas uh, emissions are not just about uh, carbon dioxide. The upper uh, two-thirds of that pie shows emissions from various energy sources, almost all CO2. You can see that the largest is power, and then use in buildings and in industry transport 14% of total emissions. Um, the non-energy emissions associated with land use, deforestation, 18%, agriculture, 14%. Those are big numbers. Right? So, most people, when they think about greenhouse gases, they think automobiles, right? Small, I mean, not insignificant, but small compared to many other sources, and we'll see in a while, maybe not the most economic place to be reducing emissions. We'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, if we go on, uh, oh, that just says that. Okay, good, let's go on. So let's talk about power. Where is the U.S. getting its power? And this is uh, U.S. power in 2008. Uh, for those of you who can't see it, just about half of our power comes from coal right now. Coal is the most carbon-laden of the fossil fuels, and hence the worst for CO2 emissions. Natural gas accounts for 20%, about half the emissions per kilowatt hour of coal. And then we see roughly 19% nuclear, 6% hydropower. The renewable energy is the one that uh, we're focusing on a lot in order to try to bring down carbon dioxide emissions. 1.4% of our electricity came from biomass. That's the burning mostly of uh, biomass in wood and paper mills for electricity. Uh, geothermal is 0.4%. Solar is 0.1%, actually 0.07% round uh, without rounding. Uh, and wind is 1.3%. Okay. So these are small numbers. If we're going to reduce emissions, we're going to have to grow uh, all of these emissions light 
sources. We go to the next chart. So what can we do? The first thing, again, is conservation and efficiency. Uh, make the price of electricity evident. Again, don't necessarily raise it, but just make it evident. For example, if there were a meter running in the corner of your laptop or TV uh, that showed how many cents per hour you were paying for your electricity, you might start to worry about leaving the Xbox on, right? If you've got children. Um, let me show this bit of data. Uh, if we go to the next chart, which um, uh, sort of illustrates the fact that people are price sensitive in how much they use. I'm sorry that you can't see this very well, but it shows how much electricity each person uses against how much they pay per kilowatt hour, uh, state by state. And what you can see is that there is a general trend as the price goes up, people worry more about what they're paying, the usage goes down. Pretty simple economics, right? Go to the next chart. Beyond conservation and efficiency by making the price evident, uh, we are doing things, efficiency standards, energy star for appliances. You will see a succession of announcements, some of which you've seen already, uh, raising the efficiency standards for light bulbs, white goods, uh, things of that sort. Uh, uh, Ohio has been the recipient of 190 million in stimulus money, uh, helping promoting energy efficiency through uh, urban uh, um, infrastructure, uh, appliances, uh, and so on. Regulatory incentives. In California, uh, they've had now for a number of years a scheme whereby utilities make more money if they deliver less electricity by promoting conservation. And that is responsible in part for the low per capita use of electricity in California residences. Buildings and city design, a lot of leverage here, a lot of leverage. About half the world's energy gets used in buildings. Um, they are not generally designed for energy efficiency. Uh, there are technologies that exist now that can easily be deployed. It's a question of making the economic case evident to the owners for retrofits, and uh, also in, in new builds, uh, uh, imposing through codes, for example, or incentivizing uh, energy efficiency in building design. And uh, there has been about $270 million to Ohio in weatherization money through the stimulus. Weatherization is a triple buy, if you like. It provides jobs for folks, it helps poor people in their energy bills, and it reduces general energy consumption. So this is a very good thing to be doing. We should be spending a lot more on that, in my opinion. And then finally, a technology thing we need to be doing is the smart grid and working on energy storage because that will help us operate the grid more efficiently. It will enable renewables. You know, wind and solar are intermittent sources. They produce electricity when they want to, when the wind blows or when the sun shines, not all the time. It's not so easy to integrate such sources of electricity into the electrical grid, which would like uh, predictability and, and stability. Um, and so we, we need to figure out how to do that. And we're working on that uh, at significant uh, funding levels. We go to the next chart. Uh, if we really want to reduce carbon emissions, we need to set a price on carbon emissions. That means there needs to be a financial incentive to reduce the emissions of carbon. If we do that, the sources that will be favored by technology and economics alone include natural gas. Natural gas is, as I mentioned, half the emissions of coal per kilowatt hour. Onshore wind which is competitive now with fossil fuels. Small and medium hydropower, the US has about 30 or 40 gigawatts of uh, capacity that could be installed in, in small hydropower that we haven't done. Nuclear fission, okay. I, I, I have said the word. Uh, um, my opinion as a technologist is that if the uh, country and the world as a whole is going to reduce emissions at reasonable cost in a timely way, uh, we've got to see a constant, if not growing, fraction of fission, just on the basis of economics, scalability, and timeliness alone. Carbon capture and storage, the burning of fossil fuels, particularly coal, in such a way that we can catch the CO2 before it goes up the smokestack and uh, put it under the ground, where we expect it will stay for many centuries. The technologies for that have all been demonstrated. We are working hard to demonstrate integral plants where you actually do this and produce electrical power at the same time. And I know Ohio has been involved in some of the demos that have been proposed. We go to the next chart. 
um, portfolio standards. So there are power portfolio standards. There's a discussion of a national one uh, in which electrical power generation would have to be done by a fraction of renewables. Um, we might think about whether we want renewable portfolio standards or low carbon portfolio standards. Renewables, for example, exclude nuclear fission and exclude carbon capture and storage, which are probably the two most material things we can be doing to reduce emissions. So uh, I have no position one way or the other on that, but just trying to state what the facts are. Go to the next chart. Gas. Gas is probably the sleeper fossil fuel uh, that people uh, are not so much aware of in the US. Uh, through advances in technology over the last decade, uh, the US has acquired a greatly increased uh, resource, or reserve actually, of uh, natural gas, predominantly in shale gas and tight gas. The technologies involve horizontal drilling, hydrofracturing, uh, and the well management to, to recover the gas. This shows the expected U.S. gas supply uh, by um, source, both historical and projected, and you see that big wedge of unconventional gas growing up, which is the shale gas. Remember, gas, this gas is domestic. It's here in the US. It's also low carbon relative to coal, and I think can be a bridge to even further reductions of carbon should we uh, start to deploy it. We'll go on to the next chart. The renewable generation capacity in gigawatts has been growing, particularly for wind. Wind, uh, I think, added five gigawatts in the last year or so of capacity. So it's taking off. Uh, my opinion, and those of a number of other people who've looked at it, is that we'll probably see wind get to about 20% of US electricity generation uh, by, say, in 20 years from now. Uh, right now, I remind you, it's about 1.3%. Uh, so it's growing rapidly and reasonably economic. All the others are pretty well flat topped out. You might ask, where is solar on that chart? The answer is solar is about one gigawatt, so just at the, at the bottom right now. It's growing rapidly, growing at double-digit rates easily, but still a very small number. Look at the next chart. Cost is really important. Um, what's shown here are the costs of various ways in cents per kilowatt hour. Wind, geothermal, biomass, concentrated solar power, photovoltaics, which are solar cells, wave, tidal, hydropower. Uh, the red line on the chart shows roughly the current cost of coal or gas-fired plants three to six cents a kilowatt hour, or nuclear about seven cents a kilowatt hour. So it's pretty clear that we've got a lot of technology development to do to try to get uh, solar uh, down to where it can compete without subsidies against some of these other uh, technologies. And of course, something like concentrated solar, if we work on it hard enough, it could well start to become competitive with the fossil fuels. This is important because in the US, while we may deploy a, a mix that may not be economically optimal in the developing world. The uh, costs of electrical power relative to coal are really important. And if we can't bring these low carbon technologies down to the point where they're competitive with coal, it's going to be very difficult to get those countries to uh, adopt um, uh, low emissions technologies. Go to the next chart. Let me click again. So, general thinking about costs of CO2 reduction. This chart shows how much you want to reduce emissions in 2050 in billions of tons of carbon dioxide versus how much does it cost. And what you can see if you look at the chart with squinty eyes is that there is a lot of reduction that you can make up to 15 gigatons at negative cost. Namely, if we improve efficiency, it's one of the great things we can and should be doing in the US you can save money while reducing emissions. There is then a broad section of steps we can take in power. Uh, some of the uh, technologies I showed you previously, that at relatively little cost, we can reduce a lot more emissions. This is, by the way, a global chart, not a US chart. And then as you get to greater emissions reductions at greater cost, transportation starts to become important. It's fortunate that it turns out this way. Remember, most of the emissions come from stationary sources, and it's good that it is low cost in order to reduce those emissions. 
A smaller amount comes from transportation, and uh, it's more expensive to reduce things there. Notice also that technology can be really important. The uncertainty in that curve is really depends on what we believe technology is going to do over the next 40 years. You go to the next uh, chart, please. Other aspects of the solutions, other things we need to do. I've been mostly talking about technology and economics, but there are other things that are really important. Let me uh, uh, go to the next board. We need technically informed, coherent, and stable government policies. And one of the things I'm trying to do with the position that I have is to help make that happen. All right? We need to educate decision makers so that they can make the right decisions, and we need to educate the public so that they will let the decision makers make what can sometimes be difficult decisions. And those of you who are journalists in the audience have a particularly important role to play in that process, I believe. We need to focus on the most material and lowest cost measures. We need to do things, again, that are timely, that can have a big impact, and can minimize economic impact. Right? Doing things that don't have those qualities is doubly bad because A, it makes you think you've done something, and B, it squanders resources that could be applied in more effective ways. So it's important to distinguish again between what could be done versus what should be done. For short and midterm technologies, in my opinion, we need to avoid picking winners and losers. Okay? We should not be favoring one technology or another. We need a level playing field for all applicable technologies. For longer term technologies, the proper role of government is to support pre-competitive research. And some of the things that we're working on are uh, gas from hydrates, methane hydrates, fusion, a long time uh, we've been working on it, getting closer, and advanced fission, advanced photovoltaics, advanced biofuels, advanced storage, electrical storage technologies. We go to the next chart. It's also important, and I say this from now from my experience in the business world for five years, business needs a reasonable expectation of a price of carbon. If a company like BP is going to invest an extra billion dollars in building an emissions light power plant, it needs to have confidence that that reduction in emissions will be worth something 30 or 40 years in the future, which is the life of that plant. 30 or 40 years compared to our political timescales, the timescales on which we do regulations, is a long time. So business needs a reasonable expectation if it's going to move. We go to the next chart. Uh, and then finally, I've tried to indicate why energy innovation is different because of the time scales, because of the ubiquity, and so on. And so we're trying a number of different things in the Department of Energy to really accelerate that innovation, respecting those differences. If we go to the first chart, Energy Frontier Research Centers, of which there is uh, at least one here at uh, Ohio State, uh, these address the underlying science, finding fundamental scientific breakthroughs to enable some of these energy technologies. We go to the next one. The hubs, you may have heard about. These are energy innovation hubs that are partnerships with academia, industry, and government that attempt to do a focused research program, the full chain from basic science through to commercialization, uh, all under one or at most uh, two, a few roofs. The, this proposal right now is uh, um, somewhere in the FY10 budget discussion that's going on in Congress. We'll go to the next one. Uh, we have an education proposal called Re-Energize that's about not only educating researchers energy scientists, particularly those fluent in technology and policy, but also clean energy workers. This is about workforce training as well. And then finally, I think the last one uh, is about RPE, the Advanced Research Project Agency for Energy. Uh, this is about modeled after the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA, uh, a way of accelerating high-risk, uh, high-impact technologies. And we're just in the process of reviewing the first round of proposals uh, for them, uh, and hope to do that funding uh, within the month, month and a half or so. Okay. Uh, finally, again, energy touches on so many different aspects of life uh, that it's important that we in the DOE coordinate with many other agencies, obviously transportation, housing, agriculture for biofuels, uh, the list goes on. All right. We, uh, okay. Um, 
And then just two words on a global perspective. Um, I've been talking mostly national. Uh, this chart shows how much energy each person uses against the GDP. It's a little bit like the emissions chart I showed you before. Uh, there are roughly 25 years of data here. The US up and to the right, again, growing relatively slowly. Uh, other developed countries at about half the energy use per capita of the US, UK, France, and so on. And then lots of countries down at the bottom, China and India, uh, where there is uh, um, a very uh, small but rapidly growing and more or less universal growth in energy use. There are no negative slopes on this chart so far, right? As everybody gets richer, they use more energy. Secondly, we got about uh, one billion people in the developed world up in, in the right, US, EU, Japan. We got about two and a half billion people down in the left-hand corner there whose energy use is rising rapidly as they develop. Our challenge is to try to get people to develop while reining in the energy use. I don't know how we do that. I, I think I know how we bring down uh, the US, how we bring down Europe to efficiency, at least to some level. I uh, don't know how we manage to satisfy the developmental needs of all those folks while uh, not using as much energy as has been historically the case. Deep challenge in technology, in policy, in uh, social matters. And then finally, the last chart again from a global perspective, which uh, impresses me greatly, is the global population, both historically and then projected out with pretty good confidence to uh, 2050. We are a little more than halfway through an almost quadrupling of the world's population. And you can see that uh, most of that growth to mid-century will occur not in the developed world, but in the developing world. And how we satisfy the developmental needs of all these folks uh, is a challenge that I predict will be occupying all of us for the next several decades. And finally, let me close. Um, my, uh, uh, you know, for the journalists, uh, what I would like to see, all right? About four or five things. First one, um, we click through. Judge technologies by cost, scale, and timeliness, all right? If we're gonna solve this problem, it's not whether you happen to have a warm spot in your heart for a technology or not. It's about whether the costs are competitive, whether it can scale to materiality, and whether it can be available now as opposed to several decades from now. We're really gonna solve this problem. Second one, don't quote big numbers without context, okay? If you say this particular solar field is gonna produce five million watts of electricity, that sounds like a big number, right? But what you should do is say it's five million watts, five megawatts of electricity, about 1% of a conventional coal-fired plant. Right? Big numbers without context are completely meaningless. I mean, they impress people, but I think give false impressions. We'll do the next one. Remember capacity factors when discussing renewables. So I showed you wind capacity before, the wind doesn't blow all the time. And so 15 gigawatts of wind capacity is really only five gigawatts of generation. You have to divide by three. Same for solar. Solar photovoltaic, you have to divide by five because the sun doesn't shine, it's low in the sky, it's cloudy sometimes and so on, all right? So the one gigawatt so far of US solar capacity is only 200 megawatts, divide by five, of electrical generation compared to 440 gigawatts that the US uses. All right? So it's a pretty small number. Okay. I, again, I say this not to denigrate renewables at all, but just that we need to understand what matters and what doesn't and how far we have to go if we're gonna solve these problems. We go to the next one. Remember a systems perspective, okay? Energy is a systems issue. Many people have aspirations to completely electrify the automobile system, and we should go to cars that run on batteries and, and get off of petroleum. That's great, and maybe one day we'll make batteries cheap enough to do that. But remember, if you do, you're gonna have to generate the electricity to charge those batteries. And if you go through the numbers, we're gonna need 30 or 40% more electricity than we're producing now. 
And at the same time, we're going to have to get rid of the coal and satisfy the 1% a year growth in electrical demand. So think about it from a systems perspective. And then finally, maybe there's one more. Raise awareness of the rest of the world, particularly in the US. I had the privilege when I was in the UK, based there for five years, to do a lot of traveling around the world. Uh, and even I, who had been a relatively well-traveled academic, was amazed at what's going on in the developing world. I think most people in the US don't have an adequate perception of what's happening or what it's going to mean for the world and for the country. I think that's it. Yeah, good. Thanks for your attention. No one ever says that you know, people will have to simply consume less over you know, their lifetime. Right. Not just drive less, yeah, but yeah. just consume less. Yeah. Right. So I, I think I talked a fair bit about efficiency, which uh, can lead to conservation. Consume less, consume less energy. The administration generally is committed to taking a leadership role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it is supporting the Waxman-Markey bill, other bills that are winding their way through the Senate, which would, for the first time, set a significant cap on U.S. emissions. The McCormick Energy Solution Conference with guest speaker Dr. Stephen Coonan is made possible by The Ohio State University.